Hey, Dr. John Doyle will be speaking tonight on ethical dilemmas in the operating room. He is a retired staff anesthesiologist in the Department of Gen General Anesthesiology at Cleveland Clinic, as well as a retired professor of anesthesiology at the Cleveland Clinic Learner College of Medicine of Case Western Reserve University. He first joined Mensa in 1972. He received his um, doctorate degree his MD degree in 1982 and his PhD in biomedical engineering in 1986, both from the University of Toronto. In 2017, he received his doctor of philosophy degree from the University of Pretoria in the field of moral philosophy. He has had a lifelong interest in neuroscience behind consciousness. His most recent book on the topic of transhumanism was published by Springer and he has received teaching awards on four occasions. And in the, the um, ent calendar entry for this, I do have the link to his, actually I can put it in the chat um, for his website in case anybody wants more information. So I will turn it over to you, Dr. Doyle. Okay, well, thank you for the uh, kind introduction. Uh, since the time I spoke last, I have become professor emeritus uh, at Case Western Reserve University, which turns out entitles me to um, their email uh, as well as free parking, uh, but that's about it. Uh, my topic is ethical conundrums inside and outside the operating room, some various sub-themes, ethics and perioperative care, principalism, utilitarianism, and virtue ethics. And I'd like to include some case studies. For anybody interested, um, you can contact me at djdoyle at hotmail.com and I will send you a copy of the slides should you be interested. And I'm putting uh, most of these slides and previous talks up at danieljohndoyle.com, my personal website. So ethics is the study of moral issues, the study of the way things ought to be. There are a number of approaches to ethical theory. On the left, we can see that there could be utilitarian or consequence-based approaches, duty-based approaches, contract-based approaches based on rights, and character-based approaches based on virtue. So I'm going to take a look at some of these and then provide some interesting conundrums and see which approach offers which kind of solution. As a rule, the most important approaches in uh, medical ethics are the deontological approach where you are based on duties like your duty to the patient and the end does not justify the means here and the utilitarian approach where the end sometimes does justify the means and so this is one of the major divides but there's also other approaches that i've made mention uh, of uh, for example virtue ethics and there's even feminist ethics that focuses primarily on a duty of caring it gets more complicated than that. You can divide ethical theories into ethics of conduct and ethics of character. Ethics of character being what was developed by Aristotle. Ethics of conduct based on the consequences or based on duties. Duty-based approaches, as we'll see, uh, is the uh, Kant approach. Um, and then consequence, uh, consequential approaches, consequentialism, uh, where everyone is affected. That's primarily uh, utilitarianism. Uh, there's also a concept of ethical egoism, where what's in it for me, what's in it for the agent, and that's promoted uh, by Anne Rand, uh, who uh, developed the uh, theory of objectivism, not really taken seriously these days. Even other approaches, the teleological approach, which involves egoism, utilitarianism, and situational ethics, the deontological approach, which involves rules, it can be a single rule, like the categorical imperative, or the golden rule we're all familiar with, as well as approaches that involve multiple rules, such as prima facie duties, principle of justice that was proposed by Rawls and the concept of proportionality. So there's a lot of things that go on in the field of ethics and not all approaches are the same. And indeed law and ethics are not the same. The scope of ethics is broad. The scope of law is narrow. Ethics means the rules or principles which define right or wrong conduct. Laws are written rules about what is right and what is wrong in various walks of life. People who reject ethical principles have to face social boycott. People who don't obey laws are subject to punishments. Ethics does not use force. 
and law uses force when necessary and so on. So there's a big distinction between law and ethics. And in particular, lawyers will be uh, um, um, keen to emphasize this difference. They are more interested in acting legally than acting ethically when uh, defending a defendant, for example. It gets even more complicated because uh, besides ethical theory, uh, there is metaethics and what does a, a moral sentence mean? Do moral values exist in the universe? Ethical theory that we've just had a look at and applied ethics is abortion moral? What obligations do journalists have? What obligations do nurses have? Do corporations have responsibility? When is lying okay? Something we'll have a look at in the Kantian world. So this is a vast field, but I'm going to concentrate on ethical issues in medicine. And there's many of them, conflicts of interest, where uh, you may refer your patients to your own laboratories, relationship with vendors, uh, particularly uh, if you have intellectual property associations with vendors, for example, you've invented something, the treatment of family members, uh, inappropriate relationship with patients, for example, dating them. What about futile care where there's no hope of the patient, but you're treating them anyway. Cultural concerns, I'll have a chance to take a look at. Truth telling, disclosure, lying for the patient's benefit, is, a, is that ever appropriate? What risks should healthcare workers be willing to countenance working while impaired? And it might not be drugs and alcohol, it might be impaired because You've worked uh, 24 hours in a row on, on call um, and you're tired having worked that call shift, but you have no choice about it. And then there's research ethics dealing with uh, scientific studies. In the operating room, we have a lot of similar things. The futile care comes up from time to time when a surgeon operates on the patient and you think there's no hope. And there's ethical conflicts with surgeons. As well, there's the concept of brain death and organ procurement or organ harvesting, participation in judicial executions, which I will have a chance to take a look at as well. Operating rooms uh, are used to carry out abortions. Teaching invasive procedures, we'll have a chance to take a look at. And cultural concerns, we'll have an example of that in a while. So here's an example of cultural concerns. Uh, Muslim forces uh, anesthetists from the operating room, a Belgian anesthetist or anesthesiologist filed a complaint against a Muslim who blocked him from entering the operating theater where his wife was to undergo emergency surgery. And so he had to go and try and provide anesthesia from a distance, something that's very difficult and puts the patient at harm. So uh, this is an example of one of the extreme things that you have to deal with sometimes in culture. In medical ethics, it's common to apply some principles. Here's seven principles that uh, are commonly applied beneficence, acting in the best interest of the patient, non-malfeasance, first do no harm, autonomy, the patient has the right to refuse or choose their treatment, very important in North America. Justice concerns the fair distribution of scarce healthcare resources, less of a concern in North America. Dignity, the patient and the patient treating the patient have the right to dignity, truthfulness and honesty, and the concept of informed consent. So these are some of the principles involved. Uh, there's a, a concept that came out of the Georgetown School of Bioethics called principalism, which involves beneficence, non-malfeasance, autonomy, and justice. And these four principles form the School of Principalism from Georgetown University. Of these, autonomy is one of the most important. The patient has the right to uh, refuse or choose their treatment. And autonomy usually trumps the other principles when dealing with competent adult Western patients. So patients can refuse treatment even though they may need it. An example of this is Jehovah's Witness patient who refuses a blood saving uh, blood transfusion and subsequently dies. Advanced directives are common in uh, medicine. And this is a living will, a declaration by the competent adult and he or she wishes to be treated should he or she become incompetent or able, unable to make valid choices. They cannot request treatment that is not in the interest of the patient. And advanced directives are legally binding. So one of the themes that comes up com um, commonly in medical ethics is consequentialism. It refers to those moral theories that hold that the consequences of one conduct are the true basis for any judgment about the morality of uh, uh, conduct. From a consequentialist point of view, a morally right act or omission is one that will provide a good outcome or consequence. The view is often expressed by the aphorism, the end justifies the means. So you get a good outcome. And different, different approach, the deontological approach or duty-based approach, 
judges the morality of an action based on the action, actions adherence to a rule or rules. Uh, a rule being, for example, never lie to your patient. Uh, so these can be sometimes in conflict. So Kantian ethics uh, emphasizes the principles behind actions rather than an action's results. Applying, uh, acting rightly, thus requires being motivated by proper universal principles that treat everyone with respect. When you're motivated by the right principles, you're over, you overcome your animal instincts and act ethically according to this source. So most important in these was Kant's categorical imperative. He was the ultimate deontological duty-based ethical theorist. He said, only act on those universal principles you would want to see followed by all humanity. Act as if the maxim of your action were to secure through your will a universal law of nature. So uh, this is Kant's categorical imperative. And one of the things is that you should never lie, ever, 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 Kant says. No exceptions. It's an absolute duty. You should never, never lie. And so the question is, what happens if a crazed murderer comes to your house with an ax and he wants to know where so-and-so is? You could say, I don't, haven't seen him in years. Or you could say, uh, sure, he's driving uh, the snowplow. Uh, well, most people would agree that it's okay to tell a lie to save a life appropriately. Another example would be when the um, Nazi guards go to Anne Frank's house and they say, where is Anne Frank? And you would say, uh, oh, she's upstairs in the attic. Or you could say, well, who's Anne Frank? Um, so one of the drawbacks of Kant's categorical imperative is that it doesn't allow for exceptions that most people would agree are appropriate. So. In the example of lying, a consequentialist may argue that lying is wrong because the negative consequences produced by lying, uh, although a consequentialist may allow certain foreseeable consequences might make lying acceptable and saving Anne Frank's life is an example one. Uh, a deontological person might argue that lying is always wrong regardless of any potential good and uh, that's the axe murder problem. And a virtue ethicist would focus less on lying in any particular instance and consider instead what a decision to tell a lie or not tell a lie said about a person's character and, and moral behavior. Uh, and the way it was explained to me once uh, is, well, what, did, what would Jesus do? So let's consider some ethical controversies that show up in the operating room, uh, giving the patient what they want, even though the surgeon is wary of the patient's choice, a conflict between beneficence and uh, autonomy. So an example would be avoiding a clinically necessary cesarean section. The obstetrician thinks a cesarean section is uh, the best thing to make sure that the baby comes out uh, healthy because there's a problem with the delivery, uh, uh, but the patient refuses. It says, I deny that. You know, it's, uh, you are overestimating the risk. Uh, avoiding a clinically necessary blood transfusion, for example. Uh, in the case uh, of the Jehovah's Witness, uh, they, these patients uh, sometimes die. One indeed did die in my uh, uh, post-anesthetic recovery room uh, because she refused a blood transfusion. Demanding a particular kind of heart valve that may not be appropriate, but avoids the need for anticoagulation, even though it doesn't last as long. Extreme plastic surgery. Uh, requesting unnecessary amputation surgery. There is a body dysmorphic condition where people want amputations, and sometimes surgeons will agree to them, um, even though it is clinically unnecessary. Now, what about circumcision? Uh, Male circumcision surgery, is it actually a form of genital mutilation? Uh, here is how the procedure is carried out. And you can make it relatively painless with the use of this cream shown on the bottom, eutectic mixture of local anesthetics. But a lot of places don't do it with anesthesia. They just do it and let the baby scream. But there is a debate. Uh, whose body, who's right? Let him choose. Uh, so here's the problem. It's a debate between freedom of religion and beneficence to the patient. So circumcision is a religious practice in Judaism and Islam. And in or if you forbid male circumcisions, then uh, even though they may not be in the interest of the patient uh, to uh, get circumcisions, uh, some people would say, well, it's a religious right 
and the right of uh, religion triumphs everything, some people would argue. Another example uh, is a matter of organ procurement among what are called Jesus Christians. If you go to the website, jesuschristians.com, they'll tell you about what their principles are. But one of the things they do is they say to get salvation, you have to do something extreme, like give up an organ for um, a patient who needs it. So we have two kidneys, you can get by on one. Uh, they offer up one of their kidneys to someone who needs it. And I remember when I was at Toronto General Hospital, we had uh, such donors and the ethics committee had, a, uh, had a, a challenge deciding whether or not they were genuine. But in the end, they decided that these people were genuine. Uh, and it's no different than uh, giving uh, a kidney to a family member, some people argued. So that's an ethical controversy. Uh, using anesthesia drugs off late for off-label indications. So in anesthesia uh, and in, in medicine, we have the classical label indications that the Food and Drug Administration offers for all the drugs. Uh, but once they are given uh, uh, labeling by the FDA, you can use them off-label for a number of indications. And in fact, in pediatrics, almost all of the use of anesthetic drugs uh, at least early on after the release, are off-label. And some people find that objectionable, but it turns out it's a, it's a case of it's uh, legally acceptable. You have to justify it, but it's legally acceptable and it provides better outcomes. Um, an example of off-label indications is the drug ketamine used in general anesthesia, which is now being used off-label for the treatment of severe refractory uh, depression, depression that is not treatable by electric convulsive therapy, not treatable by MAO inhibitors, not treatable by SSRI drugs, um, and not treatable by tricyclics. And you have failure of all these modalities of treatment. It turns out ketamine works remarkably well, and ketamine clinics are starting up uh, all over the United States and Europe, uh, but these are off-label indications for the drug. Let's take a look at some cases in more detail. Here's a case from the University of Washington uh, that's aimed at uh, uh, training anesthesiologists. Uh, so it's technically more complicated. Mr. S states unequivocally does not want CPR, he does want chest compressions in the operating room, regardless of its cause or positive prognosis. He tells his anesthesiologist he's willing to go so far and no more. The patient agrees, uh, agrees to a subarachnoid block or spinal block and sedation. So the needle goes in the back and he gets a block. He's not intubated. There's no breathing tube put in. After about 20 minutes, the patient complains of weakness in the arms, difficulty breathing. Within three minutes, his blood pressure and heart rate fall and he abruptly arrests. So uh, the standard protocol for the situation is call for help and intubate the patient, put in a breathing tube and then start CPR. So the question is, should the patient be intubated and should CPR be commenced? Well, I'll let you think about that for a second, but there is an official response and uh, uh, there's some, some more going on. Uh, he's a 73 year old man, a history of severe coronary disease, peripheral vascular disease, right hemiplegia, mild expressive aphasia, awake and alert and presents for a right low knee amputation for vascular insufficiency. His chart carries a DNA, DNA, uh, DNR order, do not resuscitate. In the holding area prior to surgery, the anesthesiologist discusses the DNR order, uh, uh, DNR order with Mr. S, who appears to be depressed. So the discussion is, with cardiopulmonary support, prognosis for total recovery from this event is excellent, with only rare cases of central nervous system damage or death reported. So if that complication occurs, uh, and you resuscitate them instantly, the chance of a good outcome is good. CPR would not be futile from a medical standpoint. Intubation and restoration of mechanical ventilation will not alone restore uh, his circulation, and these measures alone would be useless. Medications to treat blood pressure and bradycardia with slow heart rate would require at least temporary artificial circulation with chest compressions. From the viewpoint of medical futility, intubation and mechanical ventilation would be useless, senseless, unless accompanied by full CPR to circulate the drugs. So that's clear. The probable cause of this patient's arrest is cephalad towards the brain migration of local anesthetic in the subarachnoid space, leading to a high spinal block. And as a result, 
uh, of the local anesthetic going from the lumbar segments to the high thoracic region cervical segments up the spinal cord, weakness or paralysis of death uh, respiratory muscles can occur, including the intercostal muscles and the diaphragmatic muscles. The effect of local anesthetic on segments contributing to the cardiac accelerator fibers called bradycardia and even cardiac arrest. So this is something that anesthesiologists are quite familiar with. Um, they're uh, trained on this in real life and it's a common board question what to do and they know what to do. But it's hard to argue ethically for the institution of CPR in this patient who while neurologically impaired appears to have full cognitive capacity to understand and make decisions regarding his own medical care, despite preoperative discussion, which included information about a good prognosis from CPR in the OR, the patient stated clearly his wish is not to be resuscitated if an arrest occurs. Instituting CPR in this patient because the cause of the arrest is anesthesia related would be like justifying transfusion in a Jehovah's Witness patient against their will because the surgery was the cause of life-threatening hemorrhage, yet adhering to their wishes if hemorrhage was due to non-surgical injuries. Okay, so this is one of the more complicated examples, and I have some others that uh, I'd like to bring to your attention. And uh, one of the controversies that is going on now that's unique to America in many respects is phys uh, physician participation in judicial executions. This doesn't come up in Europe where um, uh, judicial executions are not permitted, and uh, it's still common though in some countries like Iran as well as in China. So here you have a description from some 20 years ago about the various means of death penalty in the United States, depending on what state you're in. And a lot of them use lethal injection. Uh, a lot of them allow electrocution. A lot of them allow hanging. Some allow a firing squad. Uh, and some of them allow all of them. Uh, electrocution was one of the uh, earliest techniques developed by none other than Thomas Edison, who wanted to demonstrate the dangers of alternating current because he was promoting a uh, direct current. It turned out that Edison was completely wrong uh, in the use of direct current for transmitting power over long distances. Uh, and it turned out that alternating current is the way we do things around the world with some exceptions. So physicians have traditionally shied away from any involvement in capital punishment, seeing themselves as healers and comforters rather than as assassins. In particular, some physician codes of ethics explicitly forbid any physician involvement in capital punishment, an example being the American Medical Association. The philosophical basis for this position is that physicians are entrusted by society to work for the benefit of their patients and for the benefit of society at large and that this trust is destroyed when medical expertise is used to facilitate judicial executions. Now, here's an example. This is from British Medical Journal from 20 years ago. Uh, it's entitled, Lethal Injection Stain on the Face of Medicine. On November 6, 2001, a 45-year-old prison inmate, Jose High, was led in a room in the Georgia Diagnostics and Classification Center in Jackson, Georgia. The room would have looked familiar to a surgeon or any doctor who performs procedures under sedation, it contained a trolley or gurney, cardiac monitor, defibrillator, medical equipment cabinets, including one for storing drugs and equipment stand, and the standard catheters, tubing, and sterile bags used to start IV lines. Hugh lay down on the trolley and a nurse started to start a peripheral uh, intravenous line to be used for lethal injection. For more than 30 minutes, the nurse had made several attempts to start the line at various locations, including his right hand, his right arm, his right leg, and his right foot. And finally, a doctor who worked under contract inserted a seven French gauge triple lumen, 20 centimeter long central venous catheter into his right sub subclavian vein. And after the patient warden gave a signal, technicians injected thiopental, six grams, bacuronium, 150 milligrams of potassium chloride, 360 milligrams into his uh, central line, and this ended his life. Of interest, uh, thiopental is not available in the United States anymore because the sole supplier of it uh, required that all users of thiopental, uh, was going to require that all users of thiopental uh, document the use of it uh, for a central record recording system because the Europeans wanted to make sure that none was used 
for lethal injection purposes. Um, so the not available in the United States is available in other countries. Pancuronium is no longer available. It's a muscle relaxant, uh, or at least more, it is not commonly available, but it has been replaced by other drugs. Uh, here is the lethal injection process. Uh, you give the thiopental, which induces sleep. You give your pancuronium or pavulon, which is a muscle relaxant, stops your breathing, and then the potassium chloride that stops the heart. And that's the traditional way of doing it. But as you can see, there are multiple problems can occur. One of the problems being establishing a good IV, which is technically difficult in a number of people, particularly in uh, prisoners who were previously IV drug abusers and used up all their veins. So the American Medical Association Council on Ethics and Judicial Affairs writes, a physician is a member of the profession uh, dedicated to preserving life when there's, no, uh, when there's hope of doing so, should not be a participant in a legally authorized execution. Physician participation in execution is defined generally as actions which fall into one or more of the following categories, an action which directly caused the death of the condemned, an action which would assist, supervise, or contribute to the ability of another individual. Um, an example of that would be starting the IV that the doctor did, an action which would automatically cause an exception, execution to be carried out on a condemned prisoner, such as pushing a button. So the American Medical Association basically says, no way. So they go and, and uh, on to say it includes, but not limited to prescribing or missing tranquilizers and other psychotropic drugs, medications that are part of the execution process, monitoring vital signs, uh, even monitoring the patient to see that they're dead is not permitted and attending observing um, as a physician and rendering of technical advice regarding execution. So all of these are forbidden by the uh, uh, American Medical Association Council. In the case where the method of execution is lethal injection, the following actions by the physician would also constitute physician participation, selecting an injection site, starting an IV line as a port, supervising injection drugs, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this is all well and good, but here is a guy who wrote a very interesting counterpoint to the British Medical Journal. Uh, this is a doctor who wrote, let me be clear, I'm opposed to the death penalty, but the fact remains that the death penalty does exist in this country, the USA. I understand that certain physicians want nothing to do with executions that result from this policy. But on the other hand, one of the duties and desires of a physician is to provide comfort and relieve pain and suffering. While capital punishment is legal, capital torture is not. I feel that we have a duty once someone has been ordered executed to ensure that the execution takes place as humane a fashion as possible. The records are ripe with stories of botched executions. Once we have made the uh, decision to end a convict's life, we have a huge responsibility to bring this event as efficiently a manner as possible. And this is where the role of the physician comes in. Enthusiasm for the role is not required, but I just not see how physicians can walk away from it, albeit unfortunately a dirty job that someone has to do. Um, here is uh, something that is arising now in some of the circles uh, among physicians and others. A more practical and humane method of execution might be use a, a hood such as that illustrated here on the left. Uh, you fill it with nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide is delivered in this concentration will lead to painless unconsciousness within a few minutes. But since no oxygen is being administered, it will lead to profound painless hypoxia and cardiac arrest in a short period of time following the onset of conscious, unconsciousness. Such an approach avoids the need to establish IV access that is needed for the lethal injection process, adds considerable simplicity, reliability of the execution process, and only one pharmacologic agent need to be used. It's nitrous oxide, which is readily available as opposed to the three traditional agents used for the lethal injection process. So this would be a much better, better way of doing it but it's interesting, we're not really doing it. So it turns out that the legal authorities uh, have come up with ways of uh, killing people that are inhumane and are unnecessarily inhumane. And then there's others in Europe who simply say, we have to get rid of capital punishment entirely. But it turns out if you look at the Gallup poll in the United States, more Americans are in favor of capital punishment uh, than are against it. Case three. Uh, what about this patient here who shows up in the emergency room with uh, do not resuscitate tattoo uh, on the bottom right? Uh, here's the guy who has a tattoo with witnesses built into his arm. Uh, do not put this patient on artificial life support. 
of any kind for any reason whatsoever, do har harvest reusable parts uh, when he's dead and then cremate all that remains. Uh, one of the things that comes up is that when you have this tattooed on, that's actually not part of the protocol that we use for a living will um, or advanced directive. We actually have legal documents and these are not really legal documents. In particular, uh, he talks about artificial life support of any kind. Well, that could be as simply as starting an IV or giving um, drugs for a patient who's got anaphylaxis from a bee sting. Um, so artificial life support of any kind, that's a bit excessive uh, in my view. And so some people would have problems dealing with this. When I have raised this issue with my colleagues repeatedly, almost all of them say, I go with what's in the paperwork. I will not go with this. Uh, what should we do with DNR orders in the operating room? Uh, so you'll have patients who come with a DNR order and a DNR bracelet. And uh, in 1992, the American Society of Anesthesiologists produced guidelines for the ethical care of patients with DNR orders. Patients do not lose their right to self-determination under anesthesia and policies that automatically suspend DNR orders, which was traditionally done in the past, are ethically unsound. So. When you have a patient who has a DNR order, a DNR bracelet, and they come to the operating room often for palliative procedures, you have to rediscuss what the DNR order should be. And this might mean that, uh, for example, in the patient that we saw uh, getting the spinal uh, that went high, uh, some sort of resuscitation might be uh, something you would negotiate for with the patient. So here um, are the ethical guidelines that have been published by the uh, Committee of Origin Ethics by the ASA, American Society of Anesthesiologists House of Delegates, updated in 2008. And, uh, there are, they distinguish between a full attempt at resuscitation, a limited attempt at resuscitation defined with regard to specific procedures, and limited attempt at resuscitation defined with regard to the patient's goals and values. Far new, more nuanced uh, uh, than simply saying, uh, we're going to suspend DNR. Uh, one of the interesting things to go back with this um, DNR is that some people want to be able to uh, have their organs harvested when possible. Uh, and uh, that can be a complicated procedure because it has to be done in a way where the organs are procured uh, in a safe manner, typically in the operating room with the heart still beating. So this can be complicated in a number of ways. Uh, here is a famous uh, Canadian case, Mallet versus Shulman. A woman was unconscious as a result of a hypovolemic shock. And she lost a lot of blood following a motor vehicle accident. Uh, the patient has a signed but undated and unwitnessed wallet card indicating she's a Jehovah's Witness and does not want to receive blood transfusions under any circumstances. And with blood, she'll almost certainly die. Given that the wallet card is incompletely filled out, what should be done? So this is a real case. Uh, and Dr. Shulman had to decide between uh, not giving blood and letting the patient die or giving the blood and having the patient live and um, hopefully not get sued. Well, he did give the blood, he did get sued and he lost uh, and he had to pay or the Canadian Medical Protective Association paid uh, a settlement to the patient uh, for the patient having lived. Uh, one of the interesting things that uh, shows up uh, with the DNR issue that I mentioned earlier is that uh, the DNR tattoo might be on, but it's not covered by all of the legal paperwork. And so some people would ignore it, but there's a different precedent that occurred uh, when there was a farmer who was out uh, with his tractor in the middle of nowhere in a huge uh, part of his farm and his tractor fell over on him and he was trapped and he knew he was dying. And he scratched out on the tractor all to life and died. When they found him, uh, they noticed that there was this will written out all to wife, which was undated, unsigned and unwitnessed. And the family, uh, some family members took and argue, argued and they said it should be divided equally, not just all to my wife. But the judge said it was all about intent. And the intent was that everything go to his wife. Uh, 
that is in contrast to the approach most people take uh, with a DNR tattoo. Um, so that's an interesting legal dif uh, difference. Case five, teaching invasive medical procedures. So uh, this is something I'm writing an article on now. Um, it was a topic that uh, was part of my uh, MA thesis from many years ago, and I never got around to publishing it. But when we teach invasive medical procedures such as the spinal or epidural shown here, uh, how much detail do we provide to the patient? Uh, and typically uh, you and your uh, resident or medical student will come in and you'll introduce yourselves uh, and uh, the procedure will be carried out and the patient will not fully understand in some cases that uh, this is the first time the patient, uh, the, that the uh, procedure has been carried out by the resident who may have seen videos and practiced on a mannequin, but this may be the first time carried out on a human. Uh, how much detail do you provide? Well, the deontological approach would be, uh, you must tell them full details, uh, but then the patient may simply say, well, forget that, and that's the end of your teaching program. Or the consequentialist approach might be, uh, we need to train doctors for the future, and if we don't allow them to participate uh, in training programs, uh, then that's not going to work for the future. So this is an example of one of the uh, conflicts between the deont deontological approach and the consequentialist approach. So time for discussion. Uh, thank you for listening to me. And I'd like to uh, uh, offer an opportunity to discuss any questions that people may have uh, in the remaining time that we have. Thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you, Dr. Doyle. That was quite interesting and informative as always. Um, so does anybody have any questions for him? Uh, Danny? Yes, th thanks, Dr. Doyle, for that. This is my first time since moving to North Carolina. I've been a member of Mensa since 2007, moved here from West Virginia, so it's great to see everybody on here. Dr. Doyle, I, I work, um, I'm now the public health director in Burke County, but previously worked in, and taught health policy in, at Western University and ran a medical society. Um, I worked a lot with the American College of Cardi Cardiology and do a lot with opioid use disorder. And one of the questions I often got was, how many times do we replace a heart valve for an intravenous drug user who continues to use drugs when they have bacterial endocarditis from that? And we didn't really have a good answer. And I didn't know if that was, uh, uh, I know I just threw this case study at you, but is there a good answer to that question? as to how, how many times you would replace a heart valve for a person who continues to use drugs? Uh, so a complicated question, uh, and there's, it's multifaceted. Uh, in a setting of unlimited resources uh, with lots of money, uh, you could carry it out as often as you want. Uh, but in the real world, particularly in a national healthcare system, uh, there's limited resources. Uh, so you might ignore the question, does he deserve a second chance uh, by saying that uh, with the limited resources, we need to use our operating room time for patients who uh, uh, have gone through, uh, gone through rehab appropriately and are not going to uh, get into this problem again. Uh, a similar problem comes up when you do renal transplantation and the patient fails to follow their post-op uh, anti rejection therapy, and then they reject again. And this is uh, a, a problem that occurs not infrequently in teenage uh, kidney recipients. So uh, there's no answer, of course. Uh, there is a pro-con debate in the literature on exactly this topic, as well as the kidney transplant topic. Uh, <coughs> and it depends on what approach you take. Uh, but in a setting of limited resources, which is the real world that we live in, I think that we have to look at um, the global picture rather than a single picture. And I would say you get one shot at it. And if you go back again, um, too bad. Uh, the uh, other problem comes up about liver, liver transplantation. What about the liver transplant patient who goes back to drinking again and requires a second transplant? Uh, when I was in medical school and liver transplants were just starting, uh, one of the professors said, I can understand liver transplantation for and listed a whole pile of uh, disorders, but I would never advocate that we liver, uh, uh, offer liver transplantation for alcoholic liver disease. 
And he said that that was just beyond the pale. But now uh, when I was at Cleveland Clinic, about half the patients that we dealt with uh, were, uh, had liver disease from uh, alcoholic liver disease, uh, but had been sober for six months. And some people say, yeah, they've been sober for six months because they've been in hospital for six months. Uh, so you can understand that the complexities to this. So uh, lots of pro-con debates in the ethics literature for all of these topics. Uh, and in the end, uh, you have to kind of arbitrarily select one point of view. And uh, for many people in health, public health, it's the big picture about the big system. Uh, if you're in Canada or, or the United Kingdom in particular with, with national healthcare systems, resources are far more limited than in the United States. Um, but in the United States, you have no insurance. Oh, what a mess you're in anyway. So um, that's another debate itself. Hope that helps. At one point, you mentioned that uh, there are nuances to the DNR for the uh, anesthesiologists, like whether it's a general DNR or DNR relating to a specific procedure or relating to the patient's goals. Is that not across the board for all medical procedures or just the anesthesiologists? Uh, no, it pretty much is for now, uh, for all medical procedures. But this refinement of the thought of DNR, um, it's really from the 1980s and 90s onwards where we rethought a lot of this stuff. But anesthesia is unique in the sense that anesthesia does involve uh, life-saving interventions or interventions that are almost always life-saving outside of anesthesia. For example, putting in the breathing tube in a patient that stops breathing. Well, we put in a breathing tube routinely in anesthesia or some sort of airway device routinely in anesthesia. Uh, so if we say, well, you can't, if you want to do a palliative procedure, for example, for a patient under general anesthesia, the breathing tube has to go in. And you have to explain to the patient, well, that's part of the process. Uh, are you agreeable to having us do that? Um, a more subtle example is uh, if the heart rate slows down because the surgeon is pulling on the peritoneum uh, or an ocular cardiac reflex you might get with some eye surgery and, and the heart slows down, uh, is it okay to give some atropine and then uh, give some chest compressions to circulate it around? Uh, because if you give the drug when the heart is moving too slowly or stopped, it doesn't circulate. So these are discussions that you'd have to carry on with the patient and their family. And um, you can see that they can get technical fairly quickly. And that can be a problem for some of the patients who might be uh, limited intellect or limited education. I think that's a good point that a lot of this, especially with the DNR, is lack of education by the general public um, on what is really considered life-saving versus futile attempts to, to resuscitate them. So, But I actually, along that lines with the DNR, I know that it is very complex, um, but I just want maybe a little bit more clarification on why you know, the farmer with the tractor, leaving it all to his wife, why that was intent, whereas the tattoos do not resuscitate and do not, um, Good I point. forget what the other one was, why that wasn't considered intent. Um, so the answer is legal authorities disagree with each other all the time. Hmm. Uh, another, twist is that the, oh. another twist was that the farmer story was a Canadian story. Oh. So well, it's a different, different set of laws, but the principles are largely the same. Well, and I can see too that people can get a tattoo and they change their mind. And so how do you know the tattoo is very valid? <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. And I was thinking the farmer was doing that like with his dying breath, right? So um, the guy with the tattoo, if he went to all that work to get the tattoo done, he could have gotten a legal document signed. Well, that's true. I, I think, and, the, and the farmer, if he had if he had done that one day and then the next day he was walking around fine and he didn't go get anything signed, you'd start questioning, well, are we sure that's in his intent? Yep, that's a very good point. In many respects, it's all about intent and intent is not always obvious. 
Yeah, the tattoo's case, even if he wanted to reverse it, he couldn't possibly. Yeah. In the case of what, which one? Tattoo. In the case of tattoo, even if he changed his mind, there's no easy way to get rid of that. You have to cover it up. Oh, let me introduce yeah. you to the new dermatology programs. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there are some excellent dermatology programs that will erase your tattoos uh, using lasers. Uh, oh. They are expensive. Yeah. Uh, it's far more expensive to have a tattoo removed than to have a tattoo uh, placed. Now, my point was actually at the time of the uh, hospital visit, he may not have intended to leave that. He might not be in the agreement with his tattoo mm -hmm. and we would not know it. No, exactly. That's exactly true. And as far as with the, the death penalty, you know, um, and you talked about the, the new helmet that you just using nitrous oxide. Why is that not taken? Why, why are they not considering that? Um, the law moves very, very slowly. And you'd have to have an advocate to push for that. What doctor wants to go and say, I've got a better way of doing it? Um, so for the most part, uh, the people most familiar with this, which would be anesthesiologists, because we use nitrous oxide all the time, uh, uh, we're not going to go and lobby our legislators and simply say, hey, listen, you have to do this better. It's not as if the American Society of Anesthesiologists is going to get involved in something so controversial. And even among themselves, uh, the American Society of Anesthesiologists uh, I would say they're probably divided evenly like the rest of the United States uh, on capital punishment. And they simply, they, they may argue simply, you know, we, we just don't want to get involved in this. And appropriately so. Uh, I was doing my original study on this. Um, uh, I wrote to uh, the American Association of Nurse Anesthetists to see if they'd be willing to be involved as well as uh, vet, uh, veterinary community. Uh, and they simply didn't reply. Hmm. So this might show my ignorance on how the capital punishment is administered, but why the old fashioned uh, guillotine or firing squad are not considered human compared to uh, these injections? I mean, I think they are in almost instantaneous as opposed to any procedure that we talked about so far. Um, the, the answer is you are correct. Uh, so the guillotine was invented by Dr. Guillotine. Uh, he wanted the guillotine as a more humane method of execution that was used at the time. At the time, they executed you by burning you at the stake. Uh, talk about horrible. So guillotine came up with this and it's instantaneous, but it is very messy. Mm. And uh, it's also messy to shoot you uh, with multiple bullets, uh, there's cleanup afterwards. What's really, really messy is when they use the, uh, the cyanide gas because that requires special techniques to evacuate the chamber in order to uh, procure the body afterwards. So it's, it's kind of funny that we put a man on the moon, 1969, but we haven't figured out that we could do a helmet with nitrous oxide for um, capital punishment. Even today, it's not done anywhere at the moment. Probably the way to make that happen would be for somebody who is on waiting to get executed for their lawyer to um, bring bring the accusation that whatever method they're going to use is inhumane and, and show that as an alternative. That would be an interesting legal strategy and it would not be hard to get literature support uh, for this. Uh, other complexities of this kind were uh, a legal challenge saying that uh, he didn't mind uh, capital punishment, uh, but he wanted his kidneys to go to his uh, daughter who was on dialysis. Uh, and some people say, well, I don't mind dying for my crimes, but what you wanna do is put me in the operating room, put me asleep under general anesthesia, procure all my organs uh, as we do ordinarily, uh, and then let the two kidneys 
uh, the heart and the two lungs and the kidney um, and the kidneys and the uh, and the liver all go to appropriate recipients. Uh, and then after all the uh, organs are procured, once you've taken the heart out, uh, you just stop up, stop the heart lung machine and and you're dead. Uh, so this would get the maximum utilitarian benefit, uh, especially uh, and is especially ethical. You could argue if it's done with the consent of the donor who agrees. Um, I wrote this up as a suggestion to the Journal of Controversial Ideas. Oh. They, reje they rejected it. Yeah, because I think the problem there is you're giving incentive to, to execute people. Yes, I was going to uh, say there was a there's rather infamous science fiction story uh, a number of years ago about, uh, you know, getting into a traffic accident and being adjudicated the death penalty for it. Uh, Something about overtime parking. <laughs> right. So so the debate there would be. Uh, if it's okay to let the organs go to waste, which is what we do, uh, and if the if the donor wants them to go away, uh, uh, wants them to be donated, what's wrong with that? Uh, there, the argument against incentivizing for capital punishment. Well, um, the argument is that that person deserves capital punishment, uh, and that's what they want. The alternative is simply uh, that that they die and the organs go to waste. So that's the controversy. And like any moral dilemmas, there are issues on both sides. Uh, but, but isn't the capital punishment procedure itself, considering all the legal challenges after the, after the initial settlement, takes like many, many years. So the incentive uh, to kill yeah. somebody for, for their organs doesn't hold water. Because it uh, could take a long time before they get their punishment. Uh, it, it could. Uh, and so uh, that's a counter argument. Uh, and like all of these things, there's arguments and counter arguments. Uh, and just as there are arguments and counter arguments for capital punishment in the first place, and judging from the number of mistakes that we've made for killing the wrong person, uh, a good case can be made for no capital punishment at all, except where uh, the evidence is overwhelming and goes beyond eyewitness testimony. Because eyewitness testimony, it turns out, is highly unreliable. But I would think that if, if it's a certainty that they're going to get executed, that I think they should be given the option. Do you want to donate your, your kidneys or your, your organs? I mean, I don't think it's incentive. Well, I, I don't, yeah, I don't think mean. it's making, you know, death penalty more appealing. I think it's more that they're going to be killed anyway. And I think they should be given that option. Do they want to donate their organ? It's like when you get your driver's license, you want to be an organ donor, you know, hey, we're going to kill you tomorrow. Do you want to donate your organs? But let's suppose you're on the jury and you have to decide whether or not to give somebody the death penalty, because I think it does. I think the jury does have to vote yes. So if, if they're making that decision, if they know that those organs are likely to go to someone else, then th there's going to be a temptation on their part to make the decision of, well, this guy is not as important as the person who would get the organs rather than saying this guy totally deserves to die for his crime. Well, see, I, I wouldn't have even thought about it that far back in the process because usually they're on death row for quite a few years yeah. and I but that's how it always is we always we always think of how it is right in the moment and then over time you find out that that it, it changes other things too and the law of unintended consequences but, but honestly I don't I think you know I understand what you're saying but it really is the prisoner's decision and I think that that should be approached to him right before he is executed because years could go by and things can get overturned. So, you know, I don't think there's that incentive from the jury because what if the prisoner says, no, I don't want to donate my organs, you know? Yeah, so. but the, the, the possibility of that happening would still be known to the jury. And they would say, well, maybe he'll donate. So whatever. Well, yeah. Oh, again, in terms of num list of various ethical uh, things that the doctors or the 
medical uh, medical professionals have to follow are there priorities in there because there could definitely be some conflicts between number 2 and number 6 or something like that so oh, are there some... are the priorities uh yeah first of all the, the first priority is follow the law the second priority is do what's right and so what's um, right could be much more right and so what what is right will vary on what ethical lens you pick, the ontological versus, uh, versus, uh, versus consequentialist. Uh, but most people, uh, if they have an ethical conundrum in the hospital, uh, they will do what the law requires first. And secondly, they will go and they'll get the ethics committee to uh, review this and make recommendations. And so uh, in most cases, if it's highly controversial, you'll have a committee that can that can help you out. But you can have a conflict between beneficence, wanting to do good for the patient, and autonomy, where you respect the patient's wishes. And the Jehovah's Witness patient is the classic example, the patient who refuses a clinically necessary blood transfusion and dies as a result. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses are uniquely American, although they're all over the world now. But uh, I have raised this issue uh, on my clinical world travels uh, and raised that issue to uh, many uh, different doctors in different nations. When I was in Beirut and I raised that issue, and they said, well, that's just a silly question. Of course, we transfuse them. We're not going to let them die. A uh, more complex issue is what do you do when uh, Jehovah's Witness is a single mom? And uh, if she dies, there's no one to take care of the baby. Uh, what, do you, what do you do there? What are the needs? Uh, what about the needs of the child? And then another question comes up. Well, what if mom or, or dad says that this baby cannot be transfused because the baby is a Jehovah's Witness patient? Uh, what do you do? And the answer there is typically you make the child a ward of the court uh, by calling the administrator on call, the administrator on call, it gets in judge with uh, in in contact with the right judge, and the judge makes the child a ward of the court, and then you transfuse it. And you might think, oh, the family would be devastated that you did this because this is a moral equivalent of rape. But it turns out they don't want their kid to die either. So much as they would condemn that this was done, they're glad that their their child lived. Interesting. So at one point in one of the slides, you had shown that patient autonomy as the highest priority. Is in the United right? States, only okay. in the United States. Uh, because if you look at all the virtues, which, which are the most important virtues? Well, some people would say charity is the most important virtue. Uh, others would say faith is the most important virtue. Well, in the case of these principles, beneficence, autonomy, non-malfeasance, uh, the idea that autonomy is number one among them, that's a uniquely Western concept. And if you go to, uh, for example, uh, uh, Islamic countries, they might take a little bit of a different view. Uh, and if you go to China, they would take a bit of a different view. They would say the interests of the state are more important than the interests of the individual. One of the things you have to remember in bioethics is that American and, and, and Western bioethics is influenced by American and Western culture. And other cultures view things very differently in many circumstances. Anybody else have any questions or comments? Well, I, I was wondering in the case where you transfuse the infant who is the ward of the court, who's gonna pay for the transfusion? <laughs> Uh, well, that's a uniquely American thing, uh, because in most most countries, uh, the national health care system would take care of it. Uh, oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. In America, uh, they would uh, bill you and uh, uh, they would bill you and then you would simply say, I don't have the money and then uh, dealt with in the, in the usual way. The American health care system in terms of funding is uniquely messed up. Uh, what you'll find is that uh, Almost all other countries in the Western world have some sort of national health care system. 
uh, many of which are imperfect, like Canada's long waiting lists, for example. Um, but that's the world we live in. Yeah, Dr. Doyle, how can we fix the American system? <laughs> uh, the answer is, uh, the answer is we can't. Uh, oh, so, please don't say that. Um, well, I've looked at it for years. It, it, it's unfixable with the, in the existing uh, political climate that has existed from uh, the last 30 years. It's interesting. OK, okay. But, it, but if you were the boss and you could change it and fix it, what would you do? Well, I, I would simply go and review what's going on in all the other countries like Australia, Canada, Germany, France, Belgium, and institute a two-tier system. Uh, the first system being a national healthcare system where uh, we would identify all of the procedures that we can fund uh, and then anything in that list below the amount of funding would not be offered. Uh, and they've done that in some places uh, in uh, Oregon, for example, uh, under their public system, they listed uh, about a thousand different procedures and the first 570 or so were funded and the ones below that uh, were not, and they were listed in the order of their efficacy. So at the very top, you'd have immunizations, and at the very bottom, you would have some of the very expensive procedures uh, with dubious outcomes, such as experimental use of bone marrow transplantation for some unusual kinds of cancers. Uh, but I'd also allow private insurance, uh, as as is done in the United Kingdom. You can have private insurance in the UK, uh, and you can. Uh, not have to wait for the NHS in, in the UK uh, for a number of procedures. The Canadian healthcare system as a rule does not allow private hospitals. Uh, and the answer to that is, uh, if you're Canadian with money and you want to bypass the system, uh, you go to Buffalo and Buffalo yeah, will be yeah. to take care of you. Or you go to Mayo Clinic or Cleveland Clinic. In fact, yeah. Cleveland Clinic in Canada uh, is primarily a referral system for Canadians with uh, lots of money or even uh, a modest income to go to the United States to get things done faster. After all, if you have a choice between spending $30,000 on an SUV or $30,000 uh, on a pair of hips, uh, well, a lot of people would pick the hips over the SUV. So in such a situation, I mean, I know this, this is dream world, would the ethics, uh, bioethics would also change, the priorities would change there from what they are today. Like patient autonomy may not be the number one after that, even in US. Oh, so that, that, that could evolve culturally, culture evolves. Uh, but right now, uh, patient autonomy is number one because the United States is a country that emphasizes individual freedoms. You will not see an emphasis on individual freedoms the same way if you go to, uh, uh, if you go to Be Beijing. Is it possible for us to get the slides though? At yes, some point? at djdoyle at hotmail.com and I will reply. Uh, also, I'll be putting, if, if I can, I'm going to put them up at my uh, website, danieljohndoyle.com. I'm, I'm happy to make them available. If you go to my website, danieljohndoyle.com, uh, you'll get all of my, or most of my previous talks and as many slide sets as I continue to make available. And you can use them for whatever you want. There's even some free books. Uh, my book on anesthesia uh, for patients, uh, the first draft is now available uh, at my website under downloads. Um, so mm -hmm. if you're uh, anticipating getting anesthesia or surgery in the future, uh, I just finished a book, the first draft of it, and you can download the PDF from the website free. Wow, that would be great. Yep, there for the taking. You used that two years ago, though. Well, yeah, but I wasn't writing it two years ago. Uh, Doctor Doyle, I I order some of my medications from Canada, even though it's illegal, <laughs> uh, because the the same medication in the U.S. might cost a hundred dollars a month more. Um, 
What are your thoughts about Big Pharma? Nancy, this is being recorded. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, so two ways of approaching it. So it's expensive in the United States compared to all the other countries because Big Pharma does all the research and uh, it costs, depending on which authority you look at, between 500 million and 700 million to develop a new drug. And of those new drugs, a lot of them don't make it. Uh, so every once in a while, you get a, a drug that's launched and then it's withdrawn from the market um, uh, because it, it turns out it, it failed uh, or it doesn't get through the phase three testing. So all of this costs money. So the capitalist approach is uh, big pharma makes money. And if you want to participate in that, then buy their stock. Uh, so the, the, the socialist approach would be, well, that should be run by the government uh, and it should be much less expensive. Um, but that approach probably doesn't generate the degree of innovation that the capitalist system offers. Uh, a case in point that's interesting is uh, HIV medications, that, which were developed uh, in the late 80s and 90s, uh, there were uh, there was HIV everywhere in Africa, and they needed HIV medication, but they couldn't afford it. So the Indian big pharma went and said, "Oh, well, we're going to make generics of all of these popular drugs." And they made generics of all these popular drugs and made them available to the African community at very modest cost by ignoring their intellectual property rights of big pharma in the U.S. Uh, and Big Pharma was going to go and complain to the World Health Organization, World Trade Organization, and other authorities, but they kind of realized that they couldn't sell to the African market at full market value anyway, and it would make them look bad, and so they kind of kept quiet about it. Um, so this uh, ignoring of the intellectual property rules resulted in uh, uh, many, many people in Africa getting their HIV effectively, treat, uh, effectively treated. Now, if we want to get an HIV vaccine, that's the next thing we need to work on, an HIV vaccine. Um, the latest HIV vaccine that was evaluated failed again. So mm. that's a big problem, and we need to work on that, and we will work on that. I think the African thing kind of points out that we're still using an 18th century intellectual property concept. And I'm wondering if we should be able to come up with something a little bit better that would still allow rewards to innovators, but still allow other people to use it. But anyway, well, you look at it for medicines is going to be different than for music, right? Yes, yes. Well, maybe not. I mean, you know, that, that would be probably one of the considerations. But, you know, I, I think, you know, we could probably do something better than a 300 year old idea. Maybe not. Maybe we can't. But, you know. Well, I think what Nancy's question really was, because I I am in pharmaceutical research, so I understand definitely the costs of, of developing uh, these drugs, that why is it that Canada and Mexico are able to market it so much cheaper than the United States? Because if I'm not mistaken, the drugs are still coming from the United States. So the company, um, the, the pharma companies here are providing it to the Canadian market who then provides it to the consumers up there. The, the drugs I get are, are actually delivered through India and it, it, they recently started uh, coming uh, from Australia. Well, then um, that, that's a whole nother situation because sometimes, you know, drugs are, are marketed in foreign countries that would never meet up the FDA standards. Oh no! That these these are usually the generic equivalents, but um, I, I trust the Indian market. I think Indian doctors are the equal of American doctors, and um, uh, I I would not continue ordering from Canada if if they were not effective drugs. The Canadian uh, drugs are also uh, reviewed by Health and Welfare Canada. It's not as if they're just imported without review. So the Canadians have their FDA equivalent, Health and Welfare Canada. Yeah. We're talking about generic drugs. 
there as opposed to uh, the ones which are still under, uh, is, is, is still manufactured only by one company. So would, why would the generic drug prices be so different? Because they, they really aren't facing the cost that the developers went through. So the, the generic drugs uh, are often priced sufficiently below the brand names that they get their market share. So uh, if you price your drugs at 70% of the cost of the brand name, then people are going to buy them. And the generic drug companies want to make a profit as well. I understand that, but yeah. the differential between different countries, they, it's basically just the supply and demand at that point, is it not? Well, there's also the negotiations between the ministries of health in the various countries and, uh, and Big Pharma. So the Canadian government, for example, will uh, negotiate prices uh, through their regulatory agencies. Any other questions for Dr. Doyle? Yeah, I, I had slightly uh, not, uh, tangential to this. We talked about the medical ethics here and it entirely seems to be revolving around, uh, and, and as it should, uh, individual patient, how to handle a specific individual patient and not uh, revolving around what is in the best interest of the general population as a whole, um, as opposed to some other professions, especially like mine, where we, our code of ethics very clearly says that the public interest is the number one priority, even uh, it trumps the priority of even my, our uh, clients. And I'm kind of surprised how these uh, ethics evolve differently for different professions. Uh, so if you look at the question of principalism, let me see if I can get the a list of principalism. On the bottom is the concept of justice concerns the fair distribution of scarce healthcare resources. Uh, and in a national healthcare system, this is very important, but in the American healthcare system, the capitalist system that is there with an emphasis on free enterprise is less concerned with that. Um, and that's just the nature of our culture and the nature of the principles that guide the nation. Ah, the, the benefic uh, beneficence and the non malfeasance. Non they are common across the board, no matter, pretty, pretty much uh, everywhere. Yes. The, is the question of what takes the priority, autonomy or the justice. And the United States autonomy is number one and arguably justice is number four. Well, I know I have a question. When would you like to present to our group again? Because I was actually looking at your PowerPoint talks. And you have a talk on nanotechnology and medicine that I think would be really cool to hear. Uh, so that talk I'm going to be giving on February 5th to a Middle East conference. And I'd be glad to give it to you anytime in the future. It's a good topic. Yeah, it sounds really interesting. Yeah. I, I was scanning through the slides and I saw the one about uh, the book Prey by Michael Crichton, which I have read that book. So um, that was quite an interesting book. Yeah. It's a some, it's somewhat related question. You mentioned earlier that Big Pharma has spent significant amount of their investments to come, come to your drugs. And therefore they, or they are, uh, they, ha they have the rights to recoup their expenses. In a private uh, environment, that is definitely true. That's how it works. Would the 
paradigm shift completely if if the uh, our medical care was as you suggested uh, possibly in the hand of like uh, government where the general public there's a there's a general uh, medical care for everyone at least one layer of it would there be would there be investments into the things which actually cut down the cost across the board in the sense it's like many many uh, innovations that would not pay out in the future, but they will cut down, make the life better. Private investments may not have any uh, interest in coming up with something like that because how are they going to recoup their benefits? Uh, so that's an interesting question. And uh, an example, what do you do about orphan conditions, super rare conditions for which there are no available treatments? And so if there's only a few hundred thousand people with a disorder, Big Pharma is not going to spend $250 million developing a drug. Uh, so maybe there's a need for alternate approaches for these unusual and rare conditions. And in fact, there's societies um, that are focusing entirely on this particular matter. One approach is to see if existing drugs can be repurposed for other uses. And the concept of repurposing drugs intended for A, but useful for B, is something that's coming up more and more in the medical literature, especially in the concept, uh, in the context of, of COVID-19. So there was a variety of medications that were repurposed for COVID-19 that were evaluated uh, in that setting. And uh, not all of them turned out to be useful, but some indeed did. The idea of repurposing drugs is that we already have the drug, we already know a lot about it. And so uh, to use it for a new purpose would be uh, relatively inexpensive compared to starting from scratch. Well, yeah, and I, I was actually referring to a slightly different uh, approach where if there are innovations that can actually provide provide help that would not require any future invest, future. Uh, that does not generate a future stream of income, then those innovations would not be of the interest for the private private uh, drug companies or private research companies to put their money in it. But if the government knows that, if the provider knows that we got to start paying paying for uh, paying for these uh, exp uh, paying for these procedures, but this if we innovate something like this, it will cut down the payment in the future. That would be that would be something. Those, those are the kind of angles that you can see coming through uh, if the paradigm shifts towards the government rather than private. Yes, yeah, so you could see uh, individuals with an innovative idea like that could apply for a grant at the governments, or could apply for grants with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, for example, uh, and many of the other philanthropic organizations that are available to fund ideas like that. So that's certainly a possibility. When you're saying about repurposing drugs, um, but you know, I, I don't see that happening because like you mentioned about off-label prescribing, which happens quite often. And because of that, then the pharmaceuticals determine that their drug is useful for another indication and thereby restarts the clinical trials process for that indication to get the, the um, you know, labeling for it so that they can market it and make more money and recoup their funds. So I, I don't see how you could repurpose a drug for another indication without the manufacturer wanting to you know, move forward to get the, the labeling rights for that other indication. They might be operating without labeling rights, number one. Number two, the labeling issues are uh, an American issue more than an international issue. Mm. Uh, and an example would be uh, in the 50s, you took aspirin, uh, two tablets, and then uh, that would take care of your pain. Now we know that aspirin is a great antiplatelet drug. Uh, and it's used primarily for its antiplatelet properties rather than for its analgesic properties. And so uh, we repurposed aspirin in, in, and in a great way. Uh, and there's a number of other drugs that have been repurposed for this. Uh, some for uh, 
with with lots of uh, good backup and some where the evidence is is weaker and used without um, uh, a lot of scientific support. So Ruth, you, you mentioning that they still have to go through the clinical studies to show the efficacy of this drug on under for different purposes. But won't it still be less expensive compared to going through the innovation right from the scratch? Oh, for sure, because you don't have to develop a new molecule. Yeah, well, I mean, once it hits the, once it's already been developed, yes, yeah, you don't have the initial um, preclinical startup. For example, all the safety studies don't have to be done. Oh, that's case. right. Right, that's true because you already have it. Well, you still have to do, I mean, well, you're right. You, I mean, you wouldn't have to do, uh, you know, because there's the different phases of, of of research. So you wouldn't have to start off with the phase one with your pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, because you would already have that. Although, so you pretty much can go right into phase two or phase three, which is a pivotal, which would take it to market. But, exactly. But a lot of companies, and I hate to say this, a lot of companies, you know, because patents are, I believe, seven years. And when they're getting near that end of seven years, then they start a new trial so they can get an additional label so they can keep the patent on it. Because if they have the patent, then, then they can't make generics. They can only sell the trade. And so I worked on Paxil for I can't tell you how many years because, you know, it was originally marketed for depression. Well, then we looked at geriatric depression and then we looked at social anxiety disorder and you know, anything you can think of, and it probably has seven labels on it now, but that was so, well, GSK back then was, it was Glaxo Welcome, I believe, um, you know, so that they can keep the patent on their drug. So, same thing, you know, but but the one, one um, that I was thinking of is minoxidil, you know, that's an antihypertension drug, antihypertensive, and they would give it to patients and found out they grew hair. So now they use it, you know, it's Rogaine for hair, hair growth. Yeah, so. if only it worked, right? If only it worked. Yeah, I know. Well, <laughs> you know, it's amazing because some of those drugs really, you know, when you were talking about with the orphan drugs, you know, I do a lot in sarcoma. So, you know, there's not a lot out in the market for sarcoma and, and especially some of the subsets of sarcoma. Um, you know, and some of the drugs that are out there now only have like 20% effective rate which is kind of sad. So Yeah, BCG is a kind of an example of both a, a repurposed drug and one that has a supply problem and not having a lot of replacements on the horizon. Did I just end the conversation again? No. <laughs> Sorry, that's my bad. I'm not that familiar with BCG, so that's why I have no comment on that. Well, that's that's one of the it, it's that that's one of the ones where regulation comes in. It, it's a uh, but the is calumet irane or whatever it is, and it's a vaccine, but it is used for immunotherapy for bladder cancer. But there is okay. only one supplier of it on the entire planet. Happens to be North Carolina, Merck. Okay, but. There are other strains that could be used for it, but the FDA has so far not approved any of them in the US. Because of the shortage, a lot of people go short on their immunotherapy. Oh. Yeah, that is sad. Yeah, but you know, like yep. this goes to the whole thing of, you know, it, it's not quite an orphan drug, but it's, you know, it's, it kind of touches on a lot of those little things we've been discussing about. You know, how, how can you get other drugs repurposed? Well, the other strains could be used, but is it worth it? Yeah. Dr. Doyle, um, I, I'm wondering um, how you feel about uh, uh, anti-COVID drugs. Um, is, is there anything that, that ameliorates uh, a, a bout with COVID? Uh, the the simple answer is I would actually have to review the literature on that. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so you could ask me two weeks if I spent a couple of evenings 
going through. Uh, but my understanding is that there, there is, uh, but I don't know any details. Uh, and it may not matter if you are fully immunized, the version of COVID that you get is so benign uh, if you're fully immunized that you really don't have to do much about it. Right. Well, well, I've I've been vaccinated twice and boosted once, and I've still gotten COVID twice. And, and at my age, I'm in a high risk group. <laughs> yes, but your symptoms would have been mild. Must have been mild. Uh, the second time they really were. The first time was be in February of 2020, 2020, before anybody knew what it was. Hmm. They tested me for flu A and flu B, and both were negative, and they. They just threw up their hands. We don't know what the hell this is. <laughs> but but once you March 10th, yeah. once, huh? You weren't vaccinated then, so you. There no, I was not then. vaccinated then. You and I was. You would have gotten a worse case then. Uh, yeah, you're, you're right. The first time I got it before anybody knew what it was, um, I was the sickest I've been in my life um, for 10 days. The second time I, I maybe was just tired. I, the, the way I knew I had it was I was I had a positive test. I suspected I got it and, and tested and I was positive. Um, uh, I, I, I continue to go to these thousand people meetings called AGs, annual gatherings. And I, I'm gonna go to Baltimore even though I've had COVID twice. And I was just wondering if there was you know, any, anything one could take to. <laughs> well, if you've only had two boosters, you, you can be up to three. I'm, I'm, I'm on three boosters now. Yeah, I am too. So I right. Plus three, I would be fully boosted, number one. Secondly, uh, when I went to the last AG, they didn't have a lot of hand washing stations there. And a lot of people weren't wearing masks. That, if I were Not only that, that, there was an idiot woman that got it that came down and stood in front of a group of 100 people and announced, I've got COVID, so I'm going to be leaving in the morning, and, and thereby infected everybody who was waiting outside the, the gala gathering room. <laughs> so, um, and, and the other thing was, there were other groups at the hotel that, uh, you know, possibly were, were carrying it in. I think number one thing is get fully boosted. Okay. Because of that. Well, I mean, our solution right now is uh, uh, to have COVID. That's interesting. It's fully vaccinated, fully boosters. And uh, I don't know how to compare it, but if this was mild, I could think of anything worse. <laughs> I've been taking right. back COVID. I had a read right, that. Right. Right. Yeah, the same thing when I got it, I was already fully boosted. I think I had like three boosters by then, and I didn't even know I had one. Huh. I had COVID. I just I had to test it because Becky had some symptoms. <laughs> yeah. Well, what I'm concerned about actually is long COVID. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm not worried about getting COVID again because my last case was so mild. But I do think from lack of energy that, that I, I'm suffering from long COVID. Um, that and, and runny nose and persistent cough and you know I've read the symptoms and I I hit multiple symptoms for long COVID and is there anything that can be done about that was my main question. Actually, there there is treatments for that and you probably should go see your local physician and he should be able to give you some options. Um, my, I just my local to... physician does not seem to be very knowledgeable about. Uh, long COVID. <laughs> well, then, then you need to find another physician. You know, the other thing, though, <laughs> let me remind you that in this particular group, it's not as if you can't read the medical literature. So if you go to PubMed.gov, which is the repository for all the medical clinical information, PubMed.gov, yeah, and then long, long COVID and start reading the latest publications. They're there for free. Or at least the abstracts are, are there for free. Okay, say so, say the URL again. Pub PubMed. Yeah, p u b m e d dot g o v. One oh, dot gov. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. That's that's where all the medical literature resides. It's the peer reviewed medical literature. They they don't include any junk in it. 
So if you type in long, long COVID, you'll get all sorts of articles, uh, not necessarily easy to read. Uh, you may have to go and do some side reading for definitions, but you'll get the state of the art. My dad was a doctor. I, I'm pretty good at reading medical literature. <laughs> See, there you go. You have an advantage right there. My physician has long COVID. Oh, he doesn't know about it. <laughs> he, he doesn't know that? But he has it. So no. I assume if he were treatable, he, he would have would have been treated. Well, they're, they're trying new treatments now. And in fact, I was trying to pull one up because one of our members, she's had it for a year or two years. And mm -hmm. she posted about the new uh, long COVID treatment that they were trying. Oh, I, I wanted, like okay. I hope they, for some, hope some they reason, that. I was thinking it was like hyperbaric, but I, I don't know why I thought that. But um, I know that it was some new new treatments. Not necessarily medications, other other types of procedures. But can they evaluate yet how effective those treatments are? That's well, the whole time. point of the is to do is to evaluate them in clinical trials. Right. Right. I'm sure there's trials going on, but I don't <laughs> I don't know how effective they are. No, but the 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 point of the medical literature is to answer that question for you. Oh, yeah, there you go. Again, it's pubmed.gov. Well, if there are no further questions, this uh, being an hour and a half, probably is a good time to uh, drive everything to a close. And uh, I look forward to future opportunities to speak. Nanotechnology has already been offered as a suggestion and one that uh, uh -huh. I would be glad to do at a future date of your choosing so I, i've enjoyed this immensely thank you so That's much so great. <laughs> it, well, it was very really helpful and dr doyle did present to us i think it was in september and we had such great feedback you, you, both presentations i think you were wonderful and we really enjoyed it so i appreciate your you giving us this presentation tonight and offering to do yet another one for us so okay we're all ears. So, I'll see you in the future for nanotechnology. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Thank you. Over and out. Bye.